as European Americans, our task is to honor our ancestors and honor as well the pain that we uh, have yet to truly process. And that way we can be free and that way we don't have to perpetuate that to other people. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Medicine Stories podcast, where we are remembering what it is to be human upon the earth. I am Amber Magnolia Hill. This is episode 38, synchronistically being released the week of my 38th birthday. And today I'm sharing my interview with Lila June. This is a really beautiful, meaningful, and I think really important conversation that we have today. We talk about how Lila, raised to acknowledge only her Native American side, came to understand and honor her indigenous European ancestors, what happens when people hate or feel massive amounts of guilt around their ancestors, their ancestry, Um, making space for everyone's healing, permission to grieve all the ancestral traumas of all peoples, Uh, going way back in time to understand colonizer slash oppressor actions. Lila said, you don't just wake up one day, drink your coffee and say, I feel like committing genocide on a whole continent of people. And of course, we are in no way excusing what has happened in the past between Europeans and the native peoples of this land, peoples of Africa. Um, Lila and I are just talking about bringing a wider perspective into these really important cultural conversations that we're having right now. Lila's early experiences with sexual abuse, alcohol, and drugs, and how they informed her perspective on restorative justice. Uh, Her pilgrimage to the sacred motherland of Europe. She said, these mountains may have lost their people, but that doesn't mean they don't need ceremony. We talk about seeing through the thin wall of time that dominates our understanding of history and remembering that the vast majority of our ancestors lived before things got broken, before cultures and humans got broken, went awry, um, went away from our wholehearted, paleolithic, uh, I mean, I don't even know what words to use to describe the kind of human I'm talking about, but before things got broken, you know, when people were whole (laughs) and living in right relationship with one another and with the earth. Lila shares this beautiful idea that indigenous languages are the sound of the land speaking through the people. Uh, We talk about how love is the only thing worth doing here and how we can't heal in the absence of love. And I ask Lila where we go from here and her answer is that it depends on where we came from. So this conversation feels really important to have on many levels for many reasons, but I kind of broke it down into the three main reasons I wanted to talk about this. And I asked Lila on, I've been following her work for years, so inspiring. Um, She's like clearly an actual genius, you know, just one of those people whose like minds work in such a special way. And then she's filtering it through this loving, compassionate, space. And she's an artist as well, a poet and a musician. And she's doing such good work in the world um, to help people to heal cultures, to heal the things that have gotten broken. And so I asked her on because in December 2018, she published a piece in Moon magazine called Reclaiming Our Indigenous European Roots. And I was really struck by what she had to say. And so even though we talk about a lot of that in this interview, I cannot recommend enough that you read that piece. I'll put it, of course, in the show notes. You could also just Google Lila June Moon Magazine. So why I think it's important to be talking about this stuff is, one, because to be talking about this stuff and to be in right relationship with our European ancestors even though it can be hard for people who care about 
justice and want to make right what was wrong in the past and who feel that ancestral burden of knowing that perhaps your direct ancestors or perhaps just people of your cultural lineage um, who maybe you didn't actually descend from, but they're still in a wider way your people, um, you know, feeling guilt about things that they did. Okay, I'm losing my train of thought, but honoring our own ancestors keeps us from culturally appropriating other people's, right? This is really simple, and this is what I've been talking about in the herbal world for a long time, that um, finding the medicine of your own people, working with the plants that are indigenous to the place that your ancestors were indigenous to, if you're an European ancestored person living in the States or elsewhere as I am, is going to just align you that much more deeply with yourself and with your work in the world and with what is already living in your blood and in your bones. And you're going to be less attracted to other people's medicine, (laughs) to things that don't belong to you. Um, that's a whole conversation on itself with a lot of nuance that I'm not going to get into fully here, but that's a really good reason to, um, look to your own indigenous European ancestry. Number two, if we don't know and love our ancestors, then we don't know and love ourselves and we can never reach our full potential. We can never truly bring the gifts that we have into the world. We can't help others heal. We can't right the wrongs. We can't repair damage in whatever way we can in our small lives and our small lifetimes if we are ignoring our ancestors. And three, getting stuck in hate for them or guilt that we are descended from certain people or certain um, cultures, again, does not facilitate healing or forward progress on social issues. Like that's not the place to get hung up if you're trying to make real change and do real good in the world. So I also would like to say, as I have said before, that I cannot cover every aspect of every subject I talk about on this podcast. I can imagine since this is a somewhat um, heated topic that some people are going to write me and say, why didn't you say this? You guys could have talked about that. You could have brought this into it. And for sure, like literally there's infinite number of other things that we could bring into this conversation, but time is limited. Time is limited. Mental capacities are limited. And this is the conversation we had. This is the intro that I have my 10 or 15 minutes time to record right now. So uh, please hold that in mind. And if you want to uh, get deeper into some of the things we talk about today, episode 27 of this podcast, Anti-Racist Genealogical Research for Everyone with Darla Antwine is good. And also episode 26, Ancestral Reverence as Devotion to the Earth with Daniel Thor. Um, You know, I specifically ask him what European ancestored people who, who know bad things happened in their lineage, that their ancestors did some bad things to people, um, what they can do to bring healing and he brought in the perspective of going farther back in that lineage to the well ancestors, the old folks, the people who were embodied before things got broken and working with them to bring healing forward through the lineage. And this is, uh, that's Daniel's approach in general to ancestral healing. And you can find out more about that at ancestral medicine, dot uh, org dot com. I don't know if you want, but I really like that perspective and think it's really valuable. Um, and Darla also in that episode twenty seven talks about ideas for um, cultural reparations, which I really loved. And then there's been other episodes where I've talked with people of European ancestry about reclaiming. Uh, their indigenous knowledge from their way back ancestors, like episode seven with Laura Valeta Vesta and nine with Ariella Daly come to mind. And I I know there's been more. Um, That's just the first things that I'm thinking of right now. 
So let me tell you about Lila. Lila June is a poet, musician, anthropologist, educator, public speaker, and community organizer of Diné, Cheyenne, and European lineages. Her dynamic, multi-genre presentation style has invigorated and inspired audiences across the globe toward personal, collective, and ecological healing. She blends studies in human ecology at Stanford, graduate work in indigenous pedagogy, and the traditional worldview she grew up with to inform her perspectives and solutions. Her personal goal is to grow closer to creator by learning how to love deeper. Okay, you guys, you know, let me also put in here that if you are liking what we talk about in this episode, then two episodes from now with Atava Garcia Swiziki. I'm sorry, Atava, if that's not how it's pronounced. It's something close to that, and I'll know it for sure by the time that episode comes out. But I just interviewed her yesterday, and we talk about many, many, many of the same things. It's really beautiful, as is this interview. So let's hear it now. Lila June. Hi, Lila. Welcome to Medicine Stories. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm very glad to have you. I was really struck by the piece that you published in Moon Magazine uh, last month called Honoring Our Indigenous, Reclaiming Our Indigenous European Roots. And what really struck me about it, so let me, if I may, explain a little bit Mm -hmm. about um, like where I'm positioned in the world <laughs> and, yeah, go for and, it. and what got me about this. So I'm an herbalist. I've been speaking, writing, talking about herbalism and ancestry and sort of the intersection of the two for years now. And what I've noticed, especially in this last year in, in these realms, in these spaces online, especially is that there's some tension around who gets to claim their ancestors who can rightfully revere and honor and cultivate a relationship with their ancestors? And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, mostly white people telling other European ancestored people that they are bad if they try to cultivate a relationship with the people they came from because of what some people who came from Europe to Turtle Island have done. Mm -hmm. And so I was so struck reading your Reading your piece and your quote that our task is to honor our ancestors, even those who caved beneath the weight of systematic destruction and became conquerors themselves. And this whole story of you coming to understand yourself as a European ancestored person, as well as a Native American ancestored person. So I would like Mm -hmm. to ask you about that journey, how you came to call in this whole other, almost half of yourself, how you grew up understanding yourself and how you came to where you are now. Absolutely. So first I'll introduce myself um, in the customary fashion. Um, Taos, New Mexico, Dayton, Sham, Patricia McCabe, Shema Wolye, Otto, Thomas Johnston, uh, Shuje Wolye, um, Akwit Ego Dene Astan and Schling. I'm from the Black Charcoal Street Division of the Red Running into Water People of the Dene Nation, um, also incorrectly known as Navajo. Um, my mother, that's my mother's clan, so then that's my clan. We're a matrilineal people. My mother's Diné. Uh, her father's the salt clan of the Diné people, so that's my uh, my Che side. My father's mother, which is my third clan, um, is uh, Cheyenne, Southern Cheyenne. And my father's father is unknown, but we definitely know he's European. And we know my father's mother's also uh, largely European as well, in addition to Southern Cheyenne. So, um, uh, as a Diné woman, that's how we first begin introducing ourselves. So, I do have a large mixture of things within me. Um, my Some of my family was very ashamed of being quote-unquote white. Um, and um, I think that uh, was passed on to me. Um I have a brother who has the same mom, same dad as me, and he came out kind of white looking and I came out brown looking. So I watched how the world treated my brother differently. Um, And I grew up 
kind of on on uh, the Taos Pueblo uh, community, which is a Native American community. So in that community, you actually don't want to be white because you get picked on and made fun of for being white. Um, and then in the in the Native community, uh, if they go out into the white world, you kind of want to be white because then you get, you know, all that racism and whatnot. So um, so anyways, I I saw how silly skin color was because literally my my brother had the same parents but he was getting treated a different way than I was um and so over time I just felt I don't know uh a tendency to not claim my European ancestry because I was ashamed of it because I my my family told me you know those are the colonizers those are the slave masters those are the bad people you don't want to claim being white, you know, just tell people that you're Diné. So that's what I would do. I would go around and I would say, oh, I'm Diné, I'm Diné, I'm Diné, I'm Diné. I wouldn't ever say, oh, and I'm part Scottish, and I'm part Scandinavian. You know, these days I do because I want to own it and I want to honor it and reclaim it. Um, but there came a time when I realized that my family's hatred for their white side was actually corroding them. And it was hurting them and hurting people around them. Because when you hate yourself, you aren't free for love to move through you as fluently as we're, we're supposed to have it move through us. And some of our caretakers would actually harm us. Um, for instance, they get really angry or they'd be really frustrated or they'd be really, you know, easily irritated and deep down, what was going on was their own self-hatred. And so I saw how when we hate ourselves, like some of my family members wish they could wipe the white off of their skin. They wish they could just, they would go out in the sun and just get really sunbaked and just like really try to like not be white. Um, and I know we live in this era where people of color are getting really damaged. Um, Black boys are getting shot by the police every 28 hours or some ridiculous statistic like that. Uh, and we live in an environment of intense racism against people of color. And so that makes it very touchy and very challenging to talk about white people hating their own race because it can be misinterpreted as us trying to distract the conversation towards, you know, the, the plight that white people are going through, um, that some white people are going through. It's like, oh, well, you're privileged. You have all the money, you have all the power, so you're not allowed to hurt. You're not allowed to feel pain. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, we're hurting and we're feeling pain. So how do we, how do we make space for everyone's healing without making it seem like we're taking up too much space as European descendants, which is often you know, happens out there in the world. So, you know, people are very touchy about that as they probably have a right to be. But um, that reminds me of Germany where, you know, the Nazis were very harsh to Jewish people. That's an understatement. You know, they killed millions of them. So then once Germany, once the World War II ended, the Soviets moved in to Germany and systematically raped all the German women. Uh, it was a total crazy show. The, the women with the Soviet occupation, German women were getting raped way, way too often. Um, and so, but in the aftermath of World War II, the German women were not allowed to grieve that because they were, quote unquote, the bad guy, right? So they're not allowed to be like, oh, I got raped. It's like, well, you know, well, don't talk about that. Let's talk about the millions of Jewish people that died. So this happens frequently throughout history where people who are on the wrong side of history also get damaged, but they're not allowed to talk about it. Um, and, I, and I know people aren't saying that they're not allowed to talk about, it, but there's this, it's, it's hard to really process it all. Um, so as an indigenous woman, I slash European woman, I wanted to give European Americans permission to grieve because where, where I come from, punitive justice doesn't work. 
if we say, oh, you're a bad white person and you're bad and you got to go in your cage and you got to say 25 Hail Marys, you know, that's supposedly what Native Americans, we said, was too Catholic or too um, guilting, you know. And what works better, we thought, was was restorative justice. Our, our, our ancestors and our elders talked about restorative justice. How do we heal people who harm people? And I think we do that by giving them a space to feel how they were hurt themselves. So I wanted to not only give other European Americans permission to grieve, but I wanted to give myself permission to grieve as a almost half European person and say, and most Native people are part European. You'll be hard to find a Native American who's not part black or part white in this continent. Um, so all of us Native people are carrying like this secret part of us that we don't want to tell anyone about. I swear, it's crazy. Like, I've heard it so many times, like, oh, and he might have a little bit of German in lurking around back there. You know, I literally have heard a father say that about his son. Um, and a Native father say that about his Native son. So, so basically what I'm trying to say is that I wanted to give myself permission to grieve of like, okay, yes, I come from this lineage of European peoples. Yes, they massacred Native people. They did horrific, unspeakable things. And what happened to them to make them want to do that? You don't just wake up one day and say, you know, I feel like having a cup of coffee and then committing genocide on a whole continent of people. That sounds fun, you know. You don't just wake up one day and do that. Something has to happen to you in order for that to be normal for you or that to even be remotely desirable. Um, and so I really started researching. And once I researched, I found that the Welsh language was prohibited as late as the 1920s. If you got caught speaking Welsh, you have to put a block of wood around your neck that said WN on it, which stood for Welsh not. The only way you could get the block of wood off your neck is if you caught another kid speaking Welsh. So we have indigenous European languages being prohibited in the exact same way that Native American languages were. You have epidemics. Um, about 98% of Native Americans were wiped out by disease. Um, you have the bubonic plague wiping out over a third of Europe overnight. You know, a third of Europe is probably a conservative estimate. Um, and not just dying in any old kind of way, but dying with like pus um, blisters popping off of your skin. And then you die, you know, like a third of everyone, you know, dying that way in front of you. That's a trauma we as Europeans haven't healed yet. Um, you have the destruction of the earth in the same exact way. If I went to Devon, England, and all of the oak trees are completely gone because the British army came and uh, turned it all to make their navy. They cut down all the oak forests. So there's like one little tiny oak grove that still stands. Um, and all of these oaks were what the quote unquote druidic uh, cultures would tend and take care of. So you have the destruction of the land in the same way. And most heartbreakingly, you have the destruction of the women in the same way. The American government would come into our native communities and rape our women one by one. Um, and they would hold them in at gunpoint to, so that they couldn't do anything about it. You know, that's how they would kill the spirit of our women and our men at the same time, is they would rape the women in front of the men. And um, then you have the witch burnings, you know, which is the same exact thing. You have women, you know, imagine getting your wife, seeing your wife get burned alive, seeing your daughter get burned alive, seeing your sister get burned alive, seeing your auntie get burned alive. This is what European men sustained. They sustained this kind of trauma. Um, so it's no wonder that European Americans have some issues. You know, they are carrying literally thousands of years of horrific trauma that they haven't even begun to deal with. Um, and that's not their fault. I mean, how can you deal with something that you don't even know how much of it you have to deal with? Um, 
And so I think that as, as European Americans, our task is to honor our ancestors and honor as well the pain that we uh, have yet to truly process. And that way we can be free and that way we don't have to perpetuate that to other people. Uh, that you know, It's pretty classic. It's almost cliche by now, but hurt people hurt people. Um, so I don't want to blab too much. You probably have more questions, but that's just a small insight into what I could probably talk about for hours and hours of why I think it's incredibly important for us as European Americans to, to grieve even when the world is telling us we're not allowed to, because the world doesn't understand that they're actually hindering justice. They're hindering healing and they're hindering change by disallowing us from grieving. And so even if all your cool social justice friends and anti-racist working friends are saying, you're white, get over it, uh, just push them aside in your mind and say, no, I have ancestors I need to connect with. I have ancestors I need to feel. I have pain that I need to grieve. And then once we grieve and, 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 feel that pain, we heal that pain because feeling is healing. And once we let go of that, or it's kind of like the only way out is through, we have to feel what happened to our people, to our land, to our entire continent. I mean, it was bad. I mean, it was like horrific. Spain has over 20 periods of documented bloodshed. You know, no wonder Juan de Oñate came over to Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico and cut off the foot of every man in the Pueblo because he's coming out of that country. You know, 20 periods of documented bloodshed, war, you know, I'm talking full out war for thousands of years. That's where we're coming from. So we must heal that and, and give ourselves permission to feel that. And let give ourselves permission to let Creator love us and hold us, because restorative justice and giving space for the quote unquote bad guy to heal is the only way that it's ever made change. What you're saying about healing, I think, is so apt. And you write in that piece that if we do not wholly love our ancestors, then we do not truly know who they are. And I would add, if we do not know who they are, then we don't know who we are. And if we hate them, then we hate ourselves. And so in this cultural moment that we're in right now, where people are waking up, it's so important to focus on that healing piece. It is. I mean, it's only everything. Yeah. (laughs) Healing. And I should say that a lot of what I talk about restorative justice is inspired by my own personal experience. Um, I, I grew up, uh, in a home full of drugs and alcohol, which is very common for native people because they, they imported alcohol into our communities to, to destroy us. So, um, I started drinking when I was 12 years old. Um, I started doing drugs when I was 11 I did everything, you know, I did cocaine, I did meth, I did heroin, I did ecstasy. Um, Later on, I became a drug dealer, just like some of my family members were. You know, some of my family members, that's how they paid the rent, where they sold drugs, right? So I grew up in a tiny little poverty-stricken town in northern New Mexico. You know, that's where I grew up. Uh, And that was my upbringing. And there was also some uh, other types of abuse growing up. I experienced a lot of sexual abuse, and I mean a lot. Um, rape was so frequent that it was, I didn't even know it was rape. I thought that's just how life was. Um, rape was normalized on the movies when I was growing up, so I was like, oh, okay, well, this is what sex is, right? But no, actually, it was rape because I never really wanted to do any of it. It was all have to, not want to. So anyways... It all culminated when I broke my hip and my spine when I was studying abroad in Chile uh, when I was 20 years old. I'm 29 now. And um, I was at Stanford University. Don't ask me how I got there. Um, 
with all the drugs and everything, but somehow I ended up there and I broke my hip and my spine in the earthquake um, in Chile. And that's when I hit rock bottom because I started drinking even more, chain smoking, uh, ecstasy was sort of my drug of choice. I would pop ecstasy pills like every week, all the time. And I was a drug dealer and I was also addicted to shoplifting. So I was like, you know, your classic criminal, like, which is what the world always told my people, like, you guys are criminals, you're nothing. So I was, I, I lived out that label. And I got down on my knees one day and I said, creator, can you get me sober? I, I can't handle this anymore. I think I might die if I don't get sober. And what creator did for me was so beautiful. I mean, talk about restorative justice. Creator sent all these people to me that taught me all these things. One of the things they taught me was it doesn't matter what happened to your body, Lila you're always going to be sacred. And they taught me the rape wasn't your fault. Well, first of all, you know, that was rape. That was a big eye opener. I was like, oh, that's rape. And number two, you know, it wasn't your fault, you know. And they said, number three, if you want to help people, if you want to be my warrior, if you want to be a warrior for creator, you got to put down the drugs. You got to put down the alcohol. So finally, at age 23, I quit for good, and I've been completely sober for six years. But that kind of grace that came into my life really proved to me what, what unconditional love for a criminal can look like. It can look so beautiful, you know. It can be so precious to tell someone, because God didn't say, like, Oh, you're doing drugs, you bad girl, you're going to go to jail, you know. <laughs> Instead, she said, I'm sorry you were surrounded by drugs when you were a little girl. I'm sorry you were raped since you were a little girl. I'm sorry that you've experienced these things. And so, similarly, what I would like to do for European, the European side of me is I would like to say, Sorry all your women were burned alive. Sorry that your land was destroyed by the Romans. I'm sorry that the church created a patriarchy in your community. I'm sorry that your women were drowned alive. I'm sorry that your languages were prohibited. I'm sorry that your people went into torture chambers. I'm sorry your people were publicly disemboweled while they were still alive. You know, I'm sorry your storytellers, the bards of Scotland, I'm sorry they were buried face down so that their stories would die with them. I'm sorry the British army did that to them. You know, that's what I would say to the guy wearing the Make America Great Again hat, <laughs> you know, if I could, as I would say, I'm sorry that happened to your ancestors. Mm. Yeah, um, Dr. Daniel Four, who works with Ancestral Healing, when he was on the show said, we don't arrive at healing by exiling those who commit harm. Yeah, and that one's hard, but it's, it's so true. It's so true. Um, so you said that you want to give white people permission to grieve, but I think you also, through this piece, clearly want to give people permission to connect with their indigenous roots and what you call the sacred motherland of Europe. And that's really taking it a step further, you know, to allow oneself to honor um, these oppressive cultures and what, what they were before before things got broken, before all that happened. And so I'd like to ask how you personally have done that in your life. Like, what is your practice of connecting to the sacred motherland of Europe? Yeah, well, the first time I had been to Europe a couple times before I really realized I was European. <laughs> like I said, I was so brainwashed to just be Danae and not acknowledge my European self that I literally, like, when I went to Europe the first two times, I didn't even realize I was going back home. 
I was like, oh, cool. I'm visiting Europe, you know. But the third time I went, I went to uh, Switzerland. And I, I had this understanding now. I was like, okay, this is where my people are from. Maybe not Switzerland exactly, but the Scandinavian side of me could have intermarried. You never know. I don't, there's even parts of my European side I don't know where it came from. But I knew I was going to this continent that was that was sacred. So I actually took the time to go onto a mountain and I treated it as a pilgrimage. And it was so mind-blowingly beautiful to just lay down and I took a piece of my hair and I put it on the earth and I just looked up at the sky and I was going through the most god-awful breakup at the time. I was like dying inside and that mountain just held me, just held me and held me and held me and was just really reassuring me that everything was going to be okay you know and and I came to it knowing I was a daughter of that mountain I was a descendant of that continent and that land and so I just took some time to pray and I thought to myself wow these mountains may have lost their people but that doesn't mean they don't need ceremony they need their prayers, they need their reverence, and they need us to come back to them and pray with them. Um, and granted, there is still a lot of ceremony going down in Europe. There is a lot of people who haven't forgotten the way. Um, but the dark worked pretty hard to obliterate the way out there, the, the medicine way. But but it's it's incumbent upon us, or or rather it's it's our it's our privilege to be able to go back there and pray with these mountains. Um, I recently went to Devon, England, and we had a full moon ceremony with all these women. And I kid you not, we were on this tour, which is a sacred site. It's like a, it's like a big naturally formed tower of rocks. They're, they're all over Devon. They're beautiful. And almost all of them have these gorgeous pools of water on top of them, just naturally forming pools of water. Um, and I went up there and there's all these really cool indigenous European women there, like with all these songs and they had their holly and their hawthorn and their mugwort and all these medicines. And they all just tossed them into the pool and we're, we were saying prayers for our grandmothers. And I kid you not... As the sun was setting in the west, the full moon was rising in the east at the exact same time. And I was just like, oh, my God, I'm in a real ceremony. You know? I'm in a real indigenous European ceremony because these women knew what they were doing. You know, they they know who they are and they know where they're from and they're doing what their ancestors had done for millennia. And uh it was just so precious to 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 come home, you know, to truly come home. Because some of my ancestors are from that island of that they call the UK. And so um, those are a couple ways that I personally try to go back home and really find myself. Um, and I think that Obviously, it's a privilege to be able to go out there, given how much a plane ticket is and stuff. But if we can find a way to go home and really feel the land and ourselves, it would be uh, just very, very powerful for everyone. Yes, that's beautiful. I just found um, ancestors in Devon yesterday. Um, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, something that I really like to talk about and remind people of is just how myopic we are in this culture, how short-sighted we are, and how wrong our perception of time tends to be. Um, like the, the fact of colonization goes back so much further than Columbus, Cortez, the mm. Mayflower. You know, we all have colonizer ancestors and indigenous ancestors somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of years that Homo sapiens have been roaming the earth. There have been so many displacements and 
um, all the things that you mentioned earlier that happened in Europe. And I really love that you, you wrote about that. You wrote about seeing through the thin wall of time that dominates our understanding of Europe. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, these, uh, the history that we know is the history that our conquerors want us to know, right? Mm. They don't want us to know that a clay figure in the shape of a woman who represents fertility and the sacredness of women and the sacredness of the earth, you know, was being made in a place that's now called Germany 40,000 years ago. You know, back in 2009, I think it was, they found this clay effigy in German soil and it dated back 40,000 years old. You know, this is, this is the scale of time we're, we're being asked to think on and even farther. We in our heads kind of go back about 2000 years and then we just kind of stop looking. Most of us, mm -hmm. there's some, you know, archeologists and historians that go way, way further, but a lot of us, that's what we're trained to think about is, Oh yeah, there's, um, there's a, uh, how would you call it? Um, Jesus is born and then anything before that, we'll just not pay too much attention to. But 2000 years is a blink of an eye. It's nothing mm -hmm. in, in the full journey that our ancestors have been through. Um, and there's a really good book called The Chalice and the Blade, which um, do, it's by a female archaeologist uh, from Europe, and she documents the transition from a chalice culture, which she defines as a, a culture of abundance, community, and equality, um, and fearlessness, and giving, to a blade culture, which is a culture of def defense, offense, um, conquer, be conquered. Um, and she she talks about the fortification of cities in Europe and when that started happening. Um, and she talks about various uh, effigies depicting the feminine um, in Europe. And she really implores us to go deeper than what we normally think of. Um, and one thing I learned recently is that Europe itself is probably, we should probably come up with a new word for Europe because Europe comes from Europa, who was a mythical character in Greek mythology. And she was, if I remember correctly, basically like a, she was collateral in a war between two male gods or two male figures, one of which I think was a god. So she was basically like what they were betting on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so you basically have the land being called a woman that's just an object to be, you know, thrown around by two men. Um, and so Europa not only is that story itself problematic, but also it's very Greco-centric, which also bleeds into Roman centricism. And just like, you know, you, you're in America, we talk about Eurocentricism, and we're like, why are these people being so Eurocentric? This is indigenous land. This is, this is native land. You know, similarly, someone in Hungary could say, why are they being so Greco-Roman centric by naming my land, Magyar Rosar, you know, that, which means the people's land. That's the real word for Hungary. Why are they naming this Europe? You know, Greece and Rome are way over there. Like, they have nothing to do with my land. They're the ones who came and conquered my land. You know, um, why are we naming Europe in this fashion? Um, so that's kind of a tangent, but I think it's it's related because it, it still locks us into that Aristotle, you know, kind of phase of Europe where we're just obsessed with that, like you said, myopic a little bit and not looking deeper into the vast, wonderful, beautiful, diverse world of indigenous Europe. 
before Napoleon, before King Louis, before um, the English crown and the British crown, you know, before all the things that we think of as European history, there was a lot going on and there's still a lot more going on than that in Europe today. Yeah, it's hard to overstate just how many ancestors we each have. And I think people often forget as well that humans were hunter-gatherers for 99% of our history as a species. Uh, you know, agriculture is about 10,000 years old. Most of our people were hunter-gatherers. Most of our people were living in the old ways. Um, it's so recent. And so when I see people get really hung up on what this or that ancestor did or this or that lineage or an entire culture that they have somewhere in their background, um, I just like to remind them to expand their scope and, you know, to do that as well as working on healing and calling in and cultivating a loving, reverential relationship with, with those ancestors. Um, you know, you said on another podcast once, you spoke about oppressed people becoming oppressors themselves, which is what we've sort of talked about. And it scares me because I feel like I'm seeing that in some people today, um, the people who aren't calling those ancestors and aren't honoring their ancestors and the ancestors of others, um, becoming oppressors themselves by acting out all the hurt and the pain of those generations. And I also heard you say that colonized people and colonizers is not who we really are and we don't have to live this way anymore. And I thought that was beautiful and wanted to ask you where we go from here. Where where do we go from here? Right. Well, <clears throat> it's a it, it depends on where you're coming from, right? Where you go, I think, depends on where you or what your role is in this huge, beautiful, chaotic orchestra of you know, 2019. Um, or whatever that, whatever that is, or whatever Gregorian name we've come up for it. But, um, you know, okay, if you're, if you're African American, you know, your role is going to be different than if you're part African American and part Native American, you know, there's a slightly different role. Your role is going to be different if you're an indigenous kid from, you know, the, Yurok Reservation in California than if you're uh, just you live in New York City and you're all your grandparents are Italian you know where we come from defines our role and where we are defines our role a European or a Italian person in New York City has a different role than an Italian person in Italy right um, but let me sum it up with this this story that my elder taught me, which sort of is the, is the philosophy that I kind of subscribe to. Okay. So he said, um, he's a Diné elder, um, Dr. Larry Emerson from Hogbeck, New Mexico. Um, and he said, Lila, in our Diné way, when we go to someone else's land, we follow their ceremonies and we follow their way of life we when we're back in the four sacred mountains you know back in our homeland we have four sacred mountains that kind of circumscribe our homeland then we do our our Diné way and they say way back in the day when there was thousands of tribes and thousands of languages being spoken on turtle island you know 98 percent of us were wiped out so however many you see today times that by 50 you know that's how many there were um, so he said, we had so many languages and so many people on Turtle Island. We had rules of engagement. We had protocols. We had ways of interacting with each other to maintain peace. And one of those ways was, if you go to another person's homeland, you follow their ceremony, you follow their way. And when they come to Dinebukea, Dinetra, you know, they're going to follow our way. They're going to we're going to teach them about the mountains and what the names are for the mountains and how to walk in respect for the mountains. He said, Belila, you're a desert woman. You, your people, Dinebkea, Dnetra, 
that is a desert land. If you go up to what's now called Washington State and you run into those salmon people, you don't know the first thing about salmon. You're not a salmon woman. Those ladies are salmon ladies. They know about the salmon. So when you talk to them, try and learn their language because their language, he said, our indigenous languages are the sound of that place speaking through us. So Dene, Dene Bazad, is the sound of the desert speaking through us. Auto, you go to Washington State and you have, uh, or, or, or Victoria Island, and you hear Slyman language. That's the sound of Victoria Island speaking through humanity. So learn that language. Learn what their creation story is. Learn how they walk. Learn how they interact with ecology. Learn how they eat. Because they are experts. They've only been there for hundreds of thousands of years. They might know how to walk there. So that's sort of my um, philosophy is that wherever we go, follow the indigenous peoples of that land. I was invited to speak at Bioneers um, in California keynote speech, you know, big, big speech. And I said, okay, Bioneers invited me, but did the Miwok invite me? <laughs> you know, did the Miwok women invite me? <laughs> so I went to the Miwok women. I said, hey, you know, they wanted me to give this big speech. What do you want me to say? And they said, or may, may I speak, you know, may I speak on your homeland? And if so, what should I say? And they gave me all these ideas. I said, well, why don't you guys say it? You know, so I brought them on stage with me and they said their piece. And then I spoke about what I wanted to talk about. And so wherever we go, honor the original peoples of that land. I went to South Africa two months ago and there was a lot of us there from indigenous women from all over the world. There was indigenous women from uh, Mexico, indigenous women from Australia, indigenous women from Europe, indigenous women from Diné. And there was a woman there of African descent, and her people had been there for a long time, you know. And so everything we did, I asked her, "What do what do we do here? Is it okay if I offer some cornmeal here, or is that not appropriate? Is it okay if I sing this song here? Would you give me that permission?" And of course, when we ask permission, we usually get a yes, because we're it's not that we can't do these things. It's just to, polite to ask first. And she said, yes, daughter, that would be good. Do that here. So I would. Oh, when I go to Devon, England, I was just quiet when I was at that full moon ceremony. Because like, I do not know this. <laughs> I do not know the stories of this land. Even though I have ancestors from here. I don't know what these women are doing. I'm just going to like sit where they are sitting and do what they're doing and, and listen, observe. Because they have knowledge of the hawthorn. They have knowledge of the apple tree. They have knowledge of the yew tree. They have knowledge of the ash tree. They're so smart about these trees here in England, quote unquote England, that I need to listen. And so that is what I would say we should do from here. Wherever you are, do your best to honor and uplift the indigenous peoples of that land. And listen to them because they have things that Western science can't even get close to yet. Thank you for that, Lila. And thank you for your constant focus on love. I find that um, it can almost be hard to talk about. Sometimes people, you know, want to, you know, make fun of the concept of love or um, belittle it in some way. And after my mother died in a car accident three years ago, I was so suffused with her love and really feel that I've just carried it like in every cell of my body ever since. And mm. even, you know, my website is mythicmedicine.love. And I was like, this is the only dot that's right for what I'm trying to do in the world now. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate how unabashedly you bring that word, that concept, that feeling into the work that you do in the world. And so I want to thank you for that. And um, thank you for everything that you do. 
You are so welcome. One time an elder told me, only love is real. And um, I don't know. I just didn't like, uh, I didn't like the, the bitter way. Uh, no judgment for those of us who take that way. But I just don't like to go that way. Um, I was raised to be a militant, you know, uh, sort of in the AIM movement type of deal. Um, American Indian movement. There was guns all in my house all the time. Um, I had to ask some of my relatives, please don't bring your guns to Standing Rock. It's not that kind of deal. So I, I think that's another reason why I'm really into love and really into nonviolence and really into peace is because I was raised around aggression. And you might even say not warranted aggression, but like, again, like having an understanding of where that comes from in native people or in any people, um, having a restorative justice lens on that. But, but I really felt how it feels to be a child among all that. And I just knew from the beginning, that's not the way I want it to take. So I'm, I'm, I'm only here for love, no matter how many people laugh at me. <laughs> And I will never deviate from love not to please the whole world because love is love is the only thing worth doing here. Not that I'm perfect. I slip all the time, but that's <laughs> that's my ideal. Right. And I and I don't mean to be like it's all love and light, um, because it's not. And I actually hate that phrase. Um, and I don't mean to gloss over, you know, the real oppression and the real pain. But if we are not bringing love into what we're doing, then then what's the point? Yeah, I'm right there with you. And I also know how hard it is to remember that. So I really forgive brothers and sisters out there who, who forget that. It's easy to forget out here. I just had that conversation with a friend before we had this call. But, but thank you for the love you do. And thanks for having me on the podcast and... My prayer is that hopefully it will help even one person. And um, and and speaking of love, just to love ourselves. I think that's the most revolutionary thing we can do right now. And the most effective thing we can do right now is love ourselves fully, no matter what's been done to us or what we've done to others, to fall back in love. Because every day is a clean slate and every day is a new day to love yourself. So thank you. Mm, hell yeah thank you Lila <laughs> thank you for taking these medicine stories in I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes you can find my blog handmade herbal medicines past podcast episodes and a lot more at mythicmedicine.love while you're there, I invite you to click the purple banner across the top of the page to take my quiz, which healing herb is your plant familiar? It's a fun and lighthearted quiz, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with the medicine that you're in need of. If you love the show, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash medicine stories. There's some killer rewards there, um, exclusive content, access to online courses, free, beautiful, downloadable ebooks, coupon codes, giveaways, and just amazing gifts provided by past guests of the podcast. All of that stuff is at the $2 a month level. Um, for a little more, you can access my herbal ebook or my small online course. And that's all there as a thank you, a huge thank you from me and from my guests for listening, for supporting this work. I love figuring out what I can give to people on Patreon. It's so fun. And I love that Patreon makes it that you can um, contribute for such a small amount a month. I'm a crazy, busy, and overwhelmed mom, and adding this project into my life has been a questionable move for sure, but I love doing it, and I love the feedback that I get from you all, and I just pray that the Patreon continues to allow me the financial wiggle room to keep on doing it while giving back to everyone who's listening. 
Um, if you're unable to do that, or if you'd like to support further, I would love it if you would subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would review the podcast on iTunes too, really helps get it into other ears. And it means so much to me when I read those reviews. It's, um, like the highlight of my week when I check them and see new ones and people are amazing. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. The music that opens and closes the show is by Marie Sue, M-A-R-I-E-E-S-I-O-U-X. It's from her song Wild Eyes, which is one of my favorite songs of all time. Thank you so much, and I look forward to you next time. <laughs>